Here's an example of how Project Baltimore makes the case that Baltimore schools get enough funding. They correctly cite Baltimore schools per pupil funding in a way that's totally misleading. Baltimore City schools spend about $16,000 per student every year, the fourth highest in the nation, which are repeated by Governor Hogan. Baltimore City schools funding is the fourth highest per pupil funding of all of the 13,500 school systems in America. Narrative put forth by Hogan and Project Baltimore dismissed the state's own studies that have found Baltimore schools need hundreds of millions of dollars a year in additional funding to reach adequacy. We recently sat down with Rob Heffelbein, Associate Dean of the School of Education at Loyola University, for a wide-ranging conversation on public education. Well, first of all, emphasizing the negative in public education isn't unique to this project. Uh, that's been a problem across media outlets and across the country for quite some time. And as somebody who spends their time in uh, working with teachers and schools and, and communities around issues of, of public education, it's frustrating. Because every school that I've ever been in has at least a handful of really powerful educators that are really um, having a huge impact on the lives of young people, wherever that might be. I've never been in a school where I can't find that. Now sometimes it's a small handful, sometimes it's a handful that's working against a structure that is making their job harder, but they're still there. And so that, that is frustrating. And there are stories in Baltimore about some amazing educators, school leaders, uh, classroom teachers, uh, community engagement, parental engagement, um, that are really remarkable. And it would be um, very much welcome to have more of those stories uh, out in the mix. Um, so my first point is I don't think they're the only ones um, guilty of that. And I worry about the implications of that. I particularly worry about young people that are thinking about education as a career. You know, we train teachers at uh, the Loyola School of Education, and I worry about that 17, 18, 19, 20 year old who's thinking, well, maybe, but all they see in the news media are these negative stories. Um, and of course, the, the idea of demonizing teachers is something I simply can't abide. I think the charter school law in Maryland is probably the strongest in the country and we really need to defend it. And what I mean by that is charter schools in Maryland are able to be what they were designed to be, which are really kind of innovation spaces. The idea is that we can loosen some of the regulation, we can give some greater autonomy, but we maintain their connection to the traditional school district. Um, it's not a union busting technique, which is often true in certain states. Um, and then those ideas, we can test some things out and say, wow, this is really working for the kids in these communities, and those ideas come back to the traditional district. That's what they were designed to do. They've really, in many cases, because of weakening the law, have turned into something very different. And I think they are, in many cases, a stepping stone to some of the things that you alluded to, which are for-profit charter school providers, which was never the original intention, um, to union busting, um, to actually the privatization of public education, which is something the American people don't even believe in. They don't come out and say they support privatization, but talk about how the narrative around public schools help, helps uh, feed into um, the end game of privatization. And you've, you've witnessed that in Indiana. Right, so I was faculty at Indiana University for 10 years, and it's been quite interesting in, in moving to Baltimore how some of the political rhetoric is literally word for word um, from what we heard 10 years ago uh, in Indiana. And so I was able to um, not just watch it happen, but actually work against it uh, with occasional successes um, over the years. And so th the general narrative is that public education is broken. And by the way, you hear that narrative uh, in a bipartisan way. Um, you may or may not remember, but uh, Obama said that during the, his first election and during the, abate, during the debates, which um, gave me considerable pause, um, that something new was on the horizon when the Democratic candidate is basically using the same language as the Republican candidate. That's new, right? That was, again, Obama. Um, so you begin with a general narrative that public education is broken, right? Um, which I can uh, contest if you'd like, but you, the public education is broken. Then you um, have to create some alternatives that are 
digestible to the public, right? I think uh, an important thing to note is there, there are opinion polls out there um, that, are, that are good sample size and bipartisan and, and um, generally good survey research, but those polls generally reflect that the American people still believe in public education and they still feel strongly about their community school. Now what's interesting is where the numbers have gone down is they often agree that public education itself as a whole isn't doing well. Oh, but our school's doing great, right? So one, there's, an, there's something happening there because both of those things can't be true. Um, so then you create these alternatives. And so I think charter schools, while not designed to be this kind of tool or stepping stone, have um, been taken up in that way. Right? So the first step is often charter school um, legislation that opens up that innovation space, but then it can be co-opted. And by uh, changing the charter school law, part of what happens is you open the door to who authorizes those charter schools, right? which by the way is a money-making enterprise, and then perhaps opening the door to for-profit charter schools. So public tax money is then going to for-profit companies I'm not sure, but I don't think a lot of people know that Walmart is the largest purveyor or the manager of charter schools in this country. Um, so public money is then being funneled into private businesses. And then invariably, the next step is usually vouchers, right? So that um, vouchers of public tax money can then go to parents to go toward private school tuition. And then, then um, again, as you say, rarely kind of outright said, but there are folks that will say this. Milton Friedman, for example, said it in the 1950s, is that we should just privatize the whole thing and let the market sort it out. And for people that are yearning for change, um, what is the track record on these, from, on these, from this project, from vouchers and for-profit schools? Um, some people say if it's working, like if it's working somewhere else, let's, let's try it here. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly understand um, how parents in certain communities might say, look, these schools haven't served the needs of our children in some cases for generations. I understand that. And uh, again, back to the urgency of the question and the importance of the public conversation around our schools, I've, I can't have a problem with that. Um, if you look at the research, though, and there is an abundance of research that's out there, what we see is that, on the whole, charter schools are schools. Are there some that are doing a fantastic job um, in terms of educating children and having success? Yes. Are there a lot kind of in the middle ground? Yes. Are there some that are um, woefully underperforming in terms of how they meet the needs of kids? Also yes. And then on top of that, you've got an increasingly long list of, uh, in places where these laws have been loosened up, you've got cases of financial fraud, you've got um, uh, negligence, you've got violation of civil rights, you've got um, serious inequity problems happening there too. But on the whole, charter schools are schools. And so just like all kinds of schools, there's a lot of factors that goes into what is a successful school and how to meet the needs of the students that attend that school. But if anybody tells you that this is the silver bullet, um, I'll try to be nice, but they're either naive or they're lying to you. A number that is often cited uh, in Project Baltimore, even in their opening press release, is that uh, Baltimore has the fourth highest per pupil funding in the country, and then they ask, you know, are students and parents getting that, getting their bang for their buck? Are, are they getting are they getting their money's worth from the public school system? Um, how do you respond to that? Well, one, it's kind of an interesting metric to trot out. Um, I understand that it's rather easy, right? As you, there's a clear number, right, that you can take a look at. But again, the issues of schools are much more complex, right? If you take something like Baltimore City Public Schools, one, you've got an old and aging um, set of facilities, right? There are different costs. Uh, related to upkeep of buildings that are in some cases 50, 100 years old. Not to mention, you've got a long history of what I would argue is inequity and underfunding. So you're starting, if we think about a racetrack, right, 
urban districts and Baltimore City public schools in general is already starting you know, 20 feet behind the starting line. Right? So if you want to talk about equity, the first thing we've got to do is equalize uh, what's there in terms of facilities, resources, staffing, professional development, et cetera. Uh, you know, we know that in Baltimore City Public Schools, the, the majority of these schools, and it might be all of them, don't drink from the water fountains because of lead in the pipes. That's a multi-million dollar fix that's been put off for years, right? That's not the case in the wealthier districts in the state of Maryland, right? So you're already starting behind that starting line. So to me, if you, talk, if you really want to talk about equity, you've got to talk about those kinds of costs. The same, you know, if you think about you know, in economics, we talk about economies of scale, right? So while you can look at per pupil expenditure, and that's the metric that folks are talking about, when you have a school building, you still have to heat the whole building, right? Or you, you know, there are costs associated with um, the facilities that aren't going to change whether there's 1,100 students in that building or there's 800. So it's a rather simplistic way to think about school funding just on its just on its face. And can you comment on the timing of this, of Project Baltimore, and there's other um, initiatives similar to it. Why are they, why are people all of a sudden concerned about Baltimore schools when they've been underfunded for generations? Well, uh, I can't speak to the timing of, of how they have decided this kind of, to start this series of, of projects and, and reporting initiatives. I can say that in Baltimore, um, that anyone who's been here uh, for a minute can, can certainly see that part of the big change is that downtown is desirable again, right? And it's not just the Inner Harbor, right? This is also a national trend, right? Cities are seeing this uh, across the country, where in the post-war period, into the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, it was um, the suburbs that were the desirable destinations and there was lots of development there was lots of money to be made by developers in those periods and so what cities did is they created infrastructure to get those folks out into the suburban communities now so this is my theory now what we're seeing is the development is downtown right and again not just the inner harbor but apartments are being built condos are being built spaces are being converted but when you have a narrative that the public school system is broken, right, young families weigh that into their consideration as to where they're going to live or where they're going to stay. Right? So it's interesting now that in some way the rhetoric has um, kicked up a, a notch or two in order to perhaps lay out some different kind of alternatives um, that might be private schools, it could be vouchers, it could be um, changes, to, changes to the charter school law, which we know that um, is, is at least implied in Governor Hogan's agenda, um, that the timing is a bit uh, coincidental. One thing I would add that we didn't quite get to is when we talk about school funding and the differences between an urban district like Baltimore City Public Schools and other districts in the, in the state of Maryland, I think it's important for people to understand what happens when school funding is either stagnant or not increasing, right? Uh, particularly to an equitable level. A lot of times what folks don't understand is that the first people to lose their jobs in a funding crisis, right, are the support staff. So it's folks like school nurses, school psychologists, social workers. Uh, for example, in my neighborhood, uh, here in Baltimore, um, there's a lot of concern about um, juveniles in the afternoons um, in the neighborhood. And it's problematic, and the way it gets talked about in my neighborhood is problematic. But what's interesting is there's a lot of concern in that neighborhood, but what they don't talk about is school funding, right? So you know whose job it is to go and track down the kid who isn't in fifth, sixth, seventh period? It's the social worker. So if you don't support school funding for Baltimore City Public Schools, you're basically creating a situation where nobody can follow up, right, on trying to reach that child, that kid, and perhaps get them back in school where they ought to be. Does that make sense? 
So these things are connected, right? And so that's another part about the conversation on public education that I think we could do a better job of, right? Of understanding how these pieces work. The other piece, of course, is class size, right? And so what I'm hearing anecdotally from some young people that I work with in West Baltimore is classes are getting bigger, right? And on its face, that's not necessarily um, that's not necessarily a driver of academic achievement. However, if you can lessen the class size, what you, the teacher can teach differently, and hopefully do that in a way that builds relationships with young people that are engaging and motivating and actually deeply impactful, right? For those kids to kind of make the right, right decisions about education that we know pay off dividends in the future. You put 41 kids in a class, Right? or th even 31, the opportunity for that teacher, no matter how well-trained, right, to, to make that personal connection is severely limited. So the, the impact of school funding is broad and it's deeply rooted in the lives of these children. And I, I, you know, I'll end where I started. Um, we have never lived up to the promises of public education in this country. And I do think we need a, a broader and a more robust conversation in the city of Baltimore about these schools. Absolutely. And following up on that, um, the question of school funding, um, county schools and city schools get very similar funding levels. But when you look at schools in the county, they look vastly different. Um, they have, appear to have more resources. Um, why is, why is that the case, where you can spend a same, similar amount of money, but the outcomes can be so different? What, what, is, what are the factors that contribute to that? Well, I'm not sure I've got a complete answer to that, to that question, but a couple things that I would just reiterate is, again, you've got um, an aging, uh, historic school district that's going to cost a lot of money uh, in order to get kind of really up to code. Um, the other is the history of inequity, right? We can't... <laughs> I'm surprised we've gone this long without talking about redlining, right, and the history of um, systemic racism uh, in, in the city of Baltimore, right? It's, it's critically tied to how we understand schooling and public education, right, in this city. Not saying that Baltimore County doesn't have some struggles there as well, because I, I believe they certainly do. But you've also got new development, new dynamics happening out in the county that are different from the urban dynamics that are here. What that means, it's a different set of challenges, right, in a lot of cases. A different set of challenges for urban schools, for Baltimore City in particular, that's going to take different types of solutions. And some of that is funding. 